Hey, drinking buddies, the Inaka Yaki pre-sale is days away. This award-winning rice sake has subtle flavors of sesame seeds, salt, shrimp, and seaweed. Add a tangy cheese, hummus, or your favorite topping and pair with an ice-cold beverage. The pre-order starts soon, so join our newsletter at www.thedrinkingbuddyshop.com and be the first to score our latest snack. Everyone was like, let's do this because we were brewing a ton of beers for a bunch of friends and their parties and weddings and it took off like crazy. This is The Drinking Buddy Show, where we explore food, craft, beverage pairings, and the entrepreneurs and tastemakers behind them. I'm Frank, founder of Drinking Buddy Artisan Snacks. On today's show, Garrett Carroll joins me from Ambitious Sales in the Bixby Knowles neighborhood of Long Beach, California. Ambitious Sales started when five friends decided to leave their careers behind and take their homebrewing hobby to the professional level. I sat down with Garrett to learn about their journey from winning a couple of brewing awards to opening their doors on Atlantic Avenue in a local landmark. We chatted about their goal of being a community hub, their plans for the future, and their latest lineup of craft beers. My name is Garrett Carroll. I'm the head brewer and co-founder of Ambitious Sales here in Long Beach, California. And where'd you grow up, Garrett? I actually grew up in Orange County in Buena Park, little town, uh, Knott's Berry Farm. It's kind of, I think, what I was oh, okay. yeah, yeah. for. Um, I was born in the South Bay. Most of my family is from uh, like Torrance, Redondo Beach, like Gardena area. They moved in the 80s uh, right when I was born. And uh, so I spent most of my time growing up in that area of Orange County, like North Orange County. Then moved to Colorado for quite a bit, I think like three years when I was eight years old, and then came back and then uh, finished out going to school in Buena Park in Cyprus, actually. So that was still kind of my, my stomping grounds. Did you have any brothers or sisters? One brother, yeah, older brother. He's actually in the South Bay right now. He lives, he lives now back in Florence. Oh, very so nice. He's st- staying true to the roots. Very nice. And so when you were a kid, what were you interested in? What did you like to do? Well... I was definitely not a sports person at all, which is hilarious because my dad was almost about to be a professional softball player. Really? Like he blew out his knee and like it was a whole oh, thing. No. But my uncle was, and like that's how he met my aunt going through the rounds, met her in like South Carolina at a game. And they've been together ever since. They actually live here in Long Beach too, which is cool. And then my brother was like super into hockey. My dad still loved like baseball and hockey, but for some reason I just never got into sports. So I was like into very technological things. So I got really into games and computers and fixing stuff. I was like building computers when I was a kid, kind of tinkering with a lot of things. And once I was about eight, I got just really into music because of my brother and I started playing drums and we had like a a band together. He kind of taught me everything I knew about music growing up. So he was like my main influence because he was seven years older than me. So he was like the prime teenager, you know, where he could introduce me to everything. So I actually grew up going to shows with him and I was like Grant's little brother that would always tag along, but I didn't look that little because I was like a big kid growing up. So people didn't know how young I was. And I was like hanging out. Like I'm like this 11 year old kid hanging out with like a bunch of 17 year olds. It's like really funny. Yeah, no, it got me really into to music. And I started playing in other bands and like doing like small tours. And that's ultimately what led me into getting into my music career, which I did all the way up until opening up the brewery. And what kind of music were you into? I grew up like listening to, it was kind of weird. It was a little bit of everything really into like the 90s emo era but also surprisingly into almost like the breach of new metal like the deftones like corn slipknot sort of thing i went to slipknot's first show in la and i was i think nine years old at the uh, <laughs> the key club which is hilarious like my brother took me and i have like vivid memories of going to that and like losing my mind so it was like the craziest thing but you know as time went on like i got really into like the post hardcore like early 2000s era and that led me into more of the emo indie transitional stuff. And I still even listen to that now, but like my music spectrum has just grown constantly since then. So I, I listen to quite an eclectic mix of things. You've been to the brewery and a lot of our I think musical tastes amongst the guys here are all very similar. Uh, Jerome is also a, a guitarist. I'm currently in a band with him too. So um, we all kind of vibe off of the same music. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty fun. So you're still playing music to this day? We still are, yeah. Me and Jerome have been doing a band called In Transmission, which is kind of like a instrumental rock sort of band. 
kind of the likes of Explosions in the Sky meets Isis, if you've ever listened to that band before. Mm. Okay. Um, so yeah, like that, we've been doing that band for almost, it's gotta been nine years. We put out three records, but we played like maybe 12 shows ever. We're more okay. of just like everyone in the band has been a professional musician at one point and toured like extensively. And now it's just kind of grown up and this is what we do for fun, but we just like to get together and like write. So we have a lockout that we've had for years now that we get together here and there and just write new stuff, record it. And like, we just like to put things out, you know, uh, whether it's on vinyl or, you know, releasing online and it's fun, you know, it keeps us active and creative. The brewery has put a little bit of a damper on all that. So like we haven't had as much time and then, you know, we have guys having kids and getting married and, you know, life goes on. So it's like harder, but we still have been getting together. Like we did once last month, which was a huge deal for all of us. So we're wow. like, oh, yeah, cool. It's fun. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't as rusty as I thought it would be. So it was, it was still really cool. Are you ever going to perform at the brewery? Probably not the brewery. It's funny. We get a lot of questions about live music here. We mm -hmm. do have like DJs play. We have a lot of friends that spin vinyl and we do like that vibe, but I don't know if we'll actually ever have a show here. You know, we've been getting a lot of inquiries about it, like from just having artists play here in general. And I don't know if that's like what we want to be known for is like having that live band environment, but it's definitely not out of the cards. I have always joked around about just since, especially since our back parking lot is a beer garden now, right. you could put a stage back there every once in a while and host like a pretty cool show. So it's in the wheelhouse at some point, but it's not like a focus at all right now. Sure. It's like a nice to have maybe. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's different licensing too, right? You yeah. Kinda... Yeah. You have to like pull, like, especially for outdoor music, you have to have specific permits and whatnot. Like we're allowed to just play our normal music and like the DJs is fine too. Um, you know, nothing that's going to be blaring essentially. Sure. Neighbors might get upset. <laughs> our, yeah, our, our neighbors <laughs> tend to like us. Hopefully I think so. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So how'd you transition then from entertainment into craft beer? It was very long transition actually. So we started home brewing in 2010, I want to say now at this point, so like 11 years ago. I and mean, that was, you know, a, a big thing where we all went to the Oregon Brewers Festival, which is one of the longest running beer festivals in the United States. And that was kind of my big introduction to craft beer. We had some friends that had relocated up there. And we had a couple of friends that have actually done just road trips and have stumbled upon it the year prior. So we made it a big goal to get a few of us to go up just to have a fun weekend. Before that, I wasn't really a beer person. I didn't drink a lot of alcohol in general. And going to that like was a very eye-opening experience for me. And it just instantly clicked with me how much I loved everything about what craft beer was. Hmm. And I was like, I need to learn everything about it, figure this out. And I got basically naturally into homebrewing just a few weeks later, like we got back and I was looking up all the beer styles and everything. I'm like, wait a minute, home brewing. This sounds cool. And you know, that technical sort of brain creative sort of thing just started going weird. And I was like, yeah, I want to get into this and just went immediately into getting a, a homebrew kit and starting it. And it just kind of took off like wildfire really quick. So yeah, we got really into, into brewing and I was in my entertainment gig, which was between booking and promoting shows and also like doing production for festivals and things like that. And that was my life essentially from high school. I started getting into this when I was 16 years old. So that my only job in my life before the brewery has been in music. I, I've never had like an actual working for an employer, retail or a restaurant or like a starting gig. I just got thrown into that and I grew through that industry as time went on. And, you know, and it's a, it's, it's an industry where you meet a lot of people and there's a lot of word of mouth that you get recommended to things and you get offered opportunities. And so that worked for me. And that's, that's kind of what I knew, but it, I developed a lot of skills through that. Ultimately, as we got through our home brewing ventures, I was slowly getting more burnt out on the music world and wanting to figure out what can I do next? And the idea of opening a brewery is I think like in any home brewer's mind is like the coolest thing ever. You want to have nice, shiny equipment and this beautiful space for people to come and enjoy what you're making. And so, you know, it's definitely like a pipe dream, but with the crew that we have as our co-founders that were, we were all home brewing together pretty much from the start. Everyone was like, let's do this because we were brewing a ton of beers for a bunch of friends and like their parties and weddings, essentially. And it took off like crazy. And we had this sort of validation of product. And we started doing more and more and more of them where it was getting almost to the point where 
we just need to stop this and focus on how can we make this a business, you know? And so, and that's ultimately what we did. And, you know, we got down and did a business plan, figured out all the numbers and finally put pen to paper and created LLC, started raising money, getting people to believe in us. And that took, you know, an extensive amount of time, probably a good two years. And then once we had money, we're like, all right, now where are we going to open? Yeah. Uh, we had an idea and uh, originally we were going to open Orange County where we were all from. We were looking in a couple cities, but nothing was really clicking. And then Long Beach happened to be a kind of new frontier for all of us. John, who is one of our business partners and lead brewer, was already living here and he loves Long Beach. Most of our friends were moving here because back in those days, it was affordable to move to Long Beach. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And so everyone was here and this is where we would go and hang out and drink and have a good time. And so it was like, all right, this is cool. Let's look into Long Beach. And we had found out about how they were changing some of the codes and allowing breweries to open up. And so eventually we finally got connected with a broker here that started showing us spaces and we landed after about like 40 different viewings on uh, Bixby Knowles and the formal Tuttle Cameras building where the brewery's at now. You had five founders, including yourself. Yeah, correct. How'd so you guys all meet? Different backgrounds, but what's the craziest part is that all of us, except for Juan, went to high school with each other. So yeah. we all went to Cypress High. And we all like were friends, but not super close. And as time went on and we started hanging out in our different social circles after high school, we started reconnecting and then homebrewing and beer is what really brought us together. Everyone had a little bit of a different background and what they were doing in their lives at that point, but beer was always something we enjoyed doing together. And then the homebrewing was even just like a cherry on top. And that's what we all got just obsessed with. And so what were some of your first beer styles? So you mentioned the weddings that you were doing and yeah, I think, when you get into home brewing, you want to challenge everything. So you, you get into it and you start brewing like some basic beers and uh, you learn about the principles of everything, but then you just want to start throwing whatever in to be creative and whatnot. So that's what ultimately led up to the ambitious sales name, because we were going off the bat, adding fruit into everything. We were doing like herbs and coffee. So we were brewing a bunch of Belgian beers because we all personally love Belgian beers. Saisons and doubles and triples and quads, like those are things we could drink all the time. And those were what we were like really excited about. It just the Belgian brewing style is so, is so fun and rustic, but there's also like no limitations to it. And I think that leads to a lot of inspiration and in what you can do versus like classic German or English brewing, which is very strict to style standards and they don't allow a lot of leeway for what you want to do. So those were the beers we were drinking the most and we weren't even brewing IPAs. We were literally only making things that we wanted to drink. And at the time we were just like, yeah, we were not really big in IPAs. We wanted to do Belgian beers. And so that was like a lot of the stuff we were brewing and, and mostly just experimental stuff where you would be, like it said, like throwing adjuncts into everything. And that was what we were having the most fun with and just trying different yeast strains and, and challenging what we could do with that. And that, that was what I think the basis of everything we were trying to do started. So how was the craft beer's reaction to that? Like, especially nearby you, you got Dutch's Brew House, Liberation Brewing Company. What did they think of you when you're coming into the neighborhood? Well, I mean, when we first opened, a big thing for us was we wanted to introduce everyone into a session beer sort of category. That was what we were really into as well, was like low ABV things. And so we were doing ambitious beers that were low ABV, like four and a half percent, five percent. And we didn't feel like we were stepping on anybody's toes or brewing anything that was trying to take over one or the other. And we were honestly welcomed so off the bat by everybody. This community has been so great. The beer industry in general, Long Beach has been awesome from day one. And we immediately became friends with like Eric and Dan over at Liberation. Jason from Dutchess has been awesome. We all talked right away and everyone knew what we were all specializing in and what I think where our crowds were sort of gonna end up being tailored. And so I think it worked out really well. And I, we actually all complement each other great in this neighborhood. Like Atlantic is awesome. Like everyone's doing something a little different. No one I feel like is, is stepping on each other over competing with each other. So, and as we all grew after opening, we started to kind of more hone in on what our customer base wanted, what we were learning through the brewing process, especially not being professional brewers, going just straight from homebrew to commercial brewing, which is you know pretty common uh, these days, but there's still that fear. You're like, we're not gonna know what to do. The beers aren't gonna work out. But I feel like even from our soft opening days, obviously we've come leaps and bounds from there. And 
I, you know, what we serve then, I, I actually can't even think about like that even being acceptable at this point, <laughs> which is kind of funny, but people, it was well received. And I think we gained a lot of loyalty off the bat from that. And we really focused on the quality of the product and what we were doing and, and making beers that we really believed in. And, and that translated, you know, pretty well as, as the year went on for our first year of business. But they didn't have long before the pandemic struck. Thanks for listening so far. If you enjoy the show, be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. Then head to www.thedrinkingbuddyshop.com and pick up some tasty pub snacks, barware, and more. Every purchase he makes helps us support small family-owned businesses in rural Japan and bring you more delicious, unique snacks to pair with your favorite beverages. Special thanks to all of you that have already started enjoying our snacks and sharing them with your buddies. Yeah, obviously, like for any person industry during the pandemic, which we're still a part of right now, and we're still feeling some effects from it. The big thing that I feel like differentiates a lot of other places is Long Beach has like a really tight sense of community and support of local business. And that's something that you don't find in a lot of places, especially here in Bixby Knowles. Like we have a very, very strong tied community to the business district here. And we have a lot of people that root for everyone to, you know, stay in business and succeed and they bring everyone out. And the pandemic definitely showed that that is very true. Like we had to pivot immediately in March to, okay, we can only sell crawlers or cans. And at the time we were really only doing crawlers. We didn't have, we weren't even canning beer yet. We had always thought about it, but it was just something that we couldn't really afford to do. And we didn't have anything dialed in yet. And so having to pivot straight to that was obviously like a whole different challenge in itself and learning to see what people would respond with. But off the bat, you know, we, we decided to take the, the plunge and get mobile canning in here, making the beers that we wanted to put out in cans right away. And people were coming in to buy cases at a time, essentially. So it was, it was great between like the can sales and the crawler sales, we were to go for essentially 10 months and our community, which I would say within walking distance of here, a solid like 50% of our clientele is all within this neighborhood. And they were coming out weekly to buy beer and support us. And they were doing the same for places just like Liberation and Dutch's and even the restaurants here. So that's why not a lot of places went under over here because they had that strong tide support to the community and they liked the products and they didn't want to see them fail. So I think that was a huge factor. And then also on top of that, I would say is the fact that now that we were canning and one of the big things is we have a very big creative side to us. Danny, one of our co-founders is our our creative director. He's done all the branding for the business and the design. He he has a long history of graphic design. That's what he did professionally before coming on with us. And he was able to really excel with can art. And I think we did a really good job of making a very aesthetically pleasing can style that ties well with our brand. And then we were now starting to distro that, which we never had distro outside of draft beer. So now that this beer is on shelves, we're getting new people that are showing up because they're having our beer for the first time in liquor stores and all the restaurants and bars that were able to sell to go throughout the pandemic. So those both factors helped, you know, keep us afloat this entire time. So regarding your colors, is there a meaning behind the colors of ambitious sales? Um, it's more not like meaning. It's, it's more of just, you know, bright welcoming, good vibe. That's kind of a big thing for us. You know, the tasting room is lighter colors. It's very open and airy. We want a welcoming vibe and we want something that you just look at and it makes you kind of almost feel calming. And it's just something that you want to be around. And that's sort of the idea. I think with all the color schemes, they might work with certain things that we're doing, especially with a specific beer style or ingredient, but the general colors for the brewery is more just about something that's like aesthetically and visually pleasing that just makes you feel good when you look at it yeah definitely i agree the vibe when you walk in is bright airy welcoming it's not like uh the opposite i would say would be like a place that's trying to be a speakeasy or something like that like dark and mysterious and things like that and that was like a big thing when we were looking for locations too historically breweries were always in industrial parks and they were just in a warehouse space and warehouses can only be so glor- like glorified. Mm-hmm. And you, know, you can invest a lot into making them really nice, but a lot of breweries don't have that kind of capital to invest in the aesthetics of the tasting room. So it's just like a cold box with taps, a nice bar top, and then a bunch of just chairs, you know, so you can sit and drink your beers. 
which I loved. I mean, that was like the fun part about growing up, going to all the craft breweries and going to San Diego and Orange County and LA. But as time went on, we're starting to realize, you know, it's kind of nice having a retail type of tasting room and production facility because it's more tailored to making it aesthetically pleasing. And and that I think really helps with our, our whole vibe here. Absolutely. And one thing that I really resonated with, with Ambitious is that you have this goal of making your brewery a social connector and like a community space. What do you do to achieve that? And do you think you could do more with that? Before the pandemic, to kind of backtrack a little bit, one of our business partners, Juan, he comes from the social entrepreneurship background. So he is really into giving back and doing community events. And especially in like the nonprofit sector, we were doing before the pandemic, quite a few events here where we were opening up our space. So if there was some sort of charitable event or some sort of organization that needed to use it to host an event, a meetup, a fundraiser, this was a space for that. So, you know, it was a welcoming space and we wanted to tie ourselves with the Long Beach community. And there's a lot happening here. It's a very big city. So that was something we were on a pretty good roll with. And it obviously had to come to a screeching halt when the pandemic started. And, and now that things are starting to reopen, we are turning our heads for fall finally to figure out what we want to do. We've been getting approached by things. It was just hard because Unfortunately, the pandemic has pushed everyone away and the idea of having a social space is, you know, the opposite right now. And it's slowly getting back into, into that, that rhythm again. And we're seeing it obviously being reopened and people are are very excited to be out and see each other, which makes us happy because that's what this whole place was built upon. So now we are exploring what we can start doing more often and hopefully for the fall and especially the new year there'll be a lot more opportunities for us to do more outreach on our end. And then also just open up our space to anyone that needs a, a place to host an event or an organization or charitable, you know, sort of situation that we can help with. That's fantastic. Now, in terms of the beer side of the business, you still just using the 10 barrel system. Do you ever think you'll go bigger? Yeah. So we're currently using our 10 barrels. We call it our like Frankenstein system. It's, you know, <laughs> mixture of professionally manufactured equipment with old dairy tank equipment, which is fairly common in the industry. You know, it's all this stainless steel connectors and sanitary fittings and things like that. So we have this big dairy tank mash tun that all of our grain goes in. That's really fun to take photos of. <laughs> it's a yeah. good collector day photo shoot. But yeah, no, we are currently in the market for uh, expanding to a 15 barrel system, which would probably be the max system size for here. But upgrading our entire cellar, we actually just put a deposit down on a canning line yesterday, which is oh, wow. really exciting for us. So we've you know, obviously been canning on a monthly basis, but we want to be able to do a little bit more rotational offerings and do smaller amounts of them. With the mobile canning services, you're very stuck on certain schedules and you have to like empty out a lot of your tanks at once. So we're looking forward to having a little bit more flexibility with what we can do. And so that's really, really fun for us. So that's, that was our our biggest expansion that we're planning. That'll be in the next two months to have that arrive. And then as we slowly get through that, we're going to upgrade our cellar. So get larger tanks. We already have 20 barrel tanks here and 10 barrels, but we're probably going to ultimately upgrade into 15s and thirties. So then we have the capability of double batching on a new system. So Definitely planning for the future right now. And hopefully by the end of this year, we'll be able to execute a full expansion. That's really exciting because then you can do like seasonal stuff and small releases. Yeah, we have a lot more variety. And, you know, the idea is hopefully to grow into a second tap room space and then also just grow our distribution footprint as well. Well, I'm sure you're still thinking about it, but any idea where that second tap room would be? Currently, there's a lot of kind of talks about where we would go. We do obviously have a lot of room to grow in our city. And um, Long Beach is such a big place that we have so many different communities here that it would be nice to possibly be on the other side of town. Not exactly sure where, but that would be a possibility in the future. And we're keep kind of keeping our eyes on, on what's available and sort of just what what's happening in a lot of the areas that, that are in those neighborhoods and seeing what makes sense. And then as we can sort of grow our footprint in Long Beach, then we can think about how we can go out, but focus mostly within our city just because of our community ties. That's really exciting. Yeah. I hope you do another one in Long Beach. And then I was just thinking because, you know, Orange has some cool breweries, but they don't have enough. Yeah, like, totally. Yeah, I know. If you could put something over there, that'd be really cool. Garrett takes us through the current tap list. Ooh, right now. So a big part for us on the pandemic was with canning beer, IPAs, 
grew a lot for us. It's just a beer style, obviously, that sells well. It still dominates uh, across the country. And like I kind of said earlier, we were never IPA focused as homebrewers. And even when we opened the brewery, we knew we had to have IPAs, but we were never overly invested into it. But as time went on, we started to invest into it because we knew that that's what people wanted as well. And so uh, I'm actually really, really happy with the progress that we've made in the last two years on our like IPA program, because through the pandemic, we did a lot of hazy IPAs. And I think we have a really, really nice single and a double profile that is very specific to us. And we're very invested into the hop farms that we're contracted with now and what we like to use with those. But the West Coast side, which is, I think, gaining some more traction again, finally, we're like really focusing on the like whirlpool and dry hopping additions and we have a beer right now called mandrake falls which i've been very 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 stoked on like it's easily i think probably unanimously in the brewery the best ipa we've ever had it's just so approachable so clean it has a classic west coast profile but with like a modern profile because the bitterness is so much lower but the aromatics are just amazing on it it's just tons of just tropical fruit nice soft citrus on it it's it's awesome Everything about it, I just only want to drink that beer right now. And that kind of goes for lagers too. We're, we've been making a lot more lagers now. We have our Gandalf the Crisp back, which is our New Zealand style Pilsner. So it's a, modeled after an Italian style Pils, but it's 100% hopped with Motueka. So you have all this just like nice lime zest in it. And it's just like a beautiful little bitterness profile. Very, very, very balanced. And like those beers excite me anytime I see them and we have them on the schedule and we have them packaged because it's just something I always want to take home and I never take beer home. And those are beers that I'm very proud of. And it's a clean profile that, you know, everything sort of shows in those styles. And and I think that they're showcased very well right now. Awesome. Now those names, is that entirely Danny coming up with those names? I mean, you got some great names. It's a group process. It started as a group text message chain for a very long time where we would just jot off name ideas. And we used to be really last minute and name beers the night before we would release them. (laughs) But as we got into canning, you realize, oh, you can't do that. You got to make artwork and labels and think about this a full month in advance kind of thing. You got to come up with the whole production schedule. So, so now it's fun, you know, we're professionals now, so we use Slack <laughs> and, oh, okay. yeah. uh, we got a Slack channel for all of our beer name ideas. So as we're thinking of just funny things, obviously Mandrake Falls is from Mr. Deeds. We have quite a few Adam Sandler references throughout the brewery and beer names that we put out in the last couple of years. And uh, yeah, we just jot them off. And, you know, sometimes like one of us is like, what is that from? And we send the YouTube clip and we're like, oh my God, we need to do this. <laughs> so it's so just, it's- you know, we have fun with it. Is Soccer Pants another reference? So Soccer Pants and the other beer, Professional Human Being, that yeah. are both on the list right now. So those are both hazy IPAs right now, which have been probably our most popular two, period, this that we've been putting out in the last year and a half. They kind of correlate. So the Soccer Pants goes to just wearing like Adidas track soccer pants. Oh, and yeah. when we were home brewing, yeah. all these guys would always show up in their soccer pants because everyone in the brewery besides me, sports person, all play soccer, also likes to chill and be relaxed and soccer pants are comfortable to wear. They would show up to the homebrew sessions and be wearing soccer pants and I'm in pants or shorts or whatever. And I'd always just get so upset. I'm like, you guys always wear soccer pants. (laughs) And, and they're like, yeah, they're comfortable. And I'm like, I will never wear soccer pants because I, and I said, because I'm a professional human being. And Danny never forgot that. And so when we were thinking one day, he's like, we have to name a beer professional human being because it's an inside joke, but it's just kind of hilarious. And then we were like, let's just call the next one soccer pants because they just tie together. So it's kind of like double entendre inside joke on both levels. I don't know about you, but I'm just one of those guys that I refuse to wear sweatpants in almost any public situation. Yeah, I'm pretty much that person as well. (laughs) I've gotten more comfortable as as time's gone on where I'm just like, but yeah, typically I I don't do that. (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm like one of the few people with this whole athleisure thing. I'm just like, stop, stop doing it. You're not going to the gym. You're not coming from the gym. Stop it. (laughs) Look look like a professional human being. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Professional. That's hilarious. That's awesome. So Garrett, is there any event we should know about coming up very soon at Ambitious? So current events that are going to be coming up, I believe we're going to have a couple different First Friday events that are coming through where they have the beer trolley happening, which is, you know, in Bixby Knowles, we have the beer trolley that goes around all the breweries here, which is really fun. They just had one this past First Fridays. They're doing one next Saturday, the 14th which will be for just the beer and wine. We have a couple of wine bars here now where they're going to hop around. 
yeah, besides that, we're still planning more food pop-ups. So I can't really say a lot of them, but there's some that are pretty exciting that are going to be coming up. So it's going to be more just staying in tune with our social media to see what we're posting about. And then hopefully in November or December, we'll be doing a big event in the back lot, which is our beer garden. So we're still planning a couple of things for that right now, but there's, there's definitely some stuff. Well, thank you very much. Where should people catch you online? You can go obviously to the old school website, ambitiousales.com, or just use ambitious sales as a handle on Facebook, Instagram, and even Twitter. Very nice, but not on TikTok yet, right? Not TikTok yet. We have been thinking about coordinating some dance moves for uh, some TikTok videos. So we'll see if that'll oh. I'll soon come. <laughs> yeah. Everybody I talk to, they're like, I don't know. <laughs> I know. It's hilarious. Need a couple of high school students or something to jump on there. Seriously, for you. They'll have to run the, the social media program just for TikTok only. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thanks so much to Garrett Carroll of Ambitious Sales. Find out more about their craft brewery by checking the links in our episode description. In our next episode, I'll be chatting with Long Beach artist LaJohn Miller. Thanks for listening to The Drinking Buddy Show. Be sure to subscribe and share it with your buddies. Check out our latest artisanal snack offerings at www.thedrinkingbuddyshop.com. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Take care and drink well.